Okay, I have 10 a.m. Second Life time, so I'm going to begin. So, as I mentioned earlier to uh, Barragon, uh, the reason I'm doing this presentation is it, it's a request from last fall, and I have been teaching telecommunications for 25 years at least, and, and longer uh, for computers and stuff, so um, started working programming back in the 60s. <laughs> so. Computers are second nature, and I've seen all the history. That's the, I always tell the students that it's kind of an advantage that I've seen the history and experienced it. But back in 1962 was kind of a, it, the um, founders of the Internet. There's a, a website that, that shows uh, at the 20th year of the Internet, the founders wrote a nice little article about uh, how it all got started and stuff. And... They point to this time where uh, there was a, I'll tell you about the more here, but basically there was a person here that envisioned having a network when there was a time where there was no computer networks at all, um, where everyone in the world could be interconnected. At that time, he was talking more about, you know, programs and data, but and probably could not envision uh, sharing uh, TikTok videos. <laughs> But um, that's kind of where the idea got started. Uh, it's hard to imagine, so let me go ahead and go to the next slide. It's hard, uh, the, the presentation today is on information revolution, first 50 years of the internet. It's hard to believe it's only been, and kitty videos, of course. <laughs> so uh, it's only been 50 years. When I was a child, the only way to, it's hard to believe that when I was a child, um, that, well, yeah, uh, it's, Star Trek, uh, internet was still, that's right. And so, you, but you, you do get some of the, those sorts of future technologies. I'm going to talk about technologies first. Now, I was talking with one of our audience earlier, and what I will be talking about is kind of like the roadway. You know, it's not the cars on the roadway or the vehicles that use the roadway it's the roadway that's what the network's all about that's what the internet really is uh and if you didn't have roads cars would be it'd be really difficult you'd have to drive across fields or something or down the beach <laughs> so um roadways are essential to have what what we have today the applications that use the internet so let's Let's go ahead and take a look at some of the concepts of, of the internet. It, it is, and, and it's only been about 50 years, give or take a couple of years here or there. So let's take a look. The first thing uh, is that there's been few times, hi Abba, okay, the few times in the history of humans that we've had what we would call a revolution. Uh, in this case, a technological revolution. A revolution is a set of changes that fundamentally transforms the society. So you're only talking about a few along the way. And one of the first was about 10,000 years ago when we changed from hunter-gatherers to more sedentary uh, lifestyle where we raise crops. Um, and then uh, that supported a about 10 times the population, and this eventually led to specializations and civilizations and all the, and war, and, you know, all the goods and bads that came with it. Only about 200 to 250 years ago, we had an industrial revolution, which changed the way we worked and the way we relate to the world and, the, and our ability to change the world, which uh, some people date the anthropomorphic Anthropic, anthropomorphic, Anthropocene era to that time period. Um, but in any case, before that, for thousands of years, people pretty much lived and died uh, in, within you know, 10, 15 miles of where they were born. And they uh, lived in large <coughs> uh, families on uh, farms. And most people were farmers and such. And then it radically changed our the way people live. Well, we're still going through 
what has been called the information revolution, which here again only started, say, 50, 60 years ago, depending on how you define it. Um, and it's definitely changing our access to knowledge and to each other. So the internet itself, while it's a network, here again, I'm talking more of the network than the, uh, like the roadway, uh, rather than cars, is essentially, it's an idea. And so an idea, you can't, um, oh yeah, there, go ahead and yeah, put the Zoom link, because that's the best way to, if you can't hear, that's the best way to see this. I've used it myself in the past. Uh, so the internet's an idea, and it can't be patented. It's not held by one company. I, ideas can't be. So it's fortunate for us that the creators of the internet basically lived at a time of the counter in the United States, of the counter uh, revolution or, or, or uh, society, the hippie culture, if you want to call it that, because one of the main concepts of that time was to share what you had. And so instead of commercializing it. So they basically realized that, that what they were creating was too valuable not to share. And so that led to 5 billion people today being on the Internet. Otherwise, it would have been some commercialized product that you'd have to have paid a lot of money for to get to. So the other thing is every um, detail of how the Internet works is publicly available. It's what's called open architecture, so that uh, people can make compatible devices. If you want, now I don't, I was, uh, I only have an hour to two, 50 years, so there is something called Request for Comments, or RFC. And if somebody wants to put a link uh, there, you can actually see from the very beginning, 1969. Um, well, and, and Syzygy, you've got the exact, that's, that's, precisely uh, why it's become so rich and interesting and all the different stuff that came out of it is because uh, if you didn't share, you wouldn't have. Just like one of our reasons for having the science circle and uh, the Edgiverse around us for sharing and facilitating education is there's so many ideas out there that you, it, it seems a shame that you would bottle them up or, or sell them in a jar. So uh, if you look at RFC, if somebody might want to look at that and, and put uh, a link, is you can see from the very beginning in 1969, every single detail of how the Internet works. It's, it's totally public. Um, but also the Internet was not designed, it was designed for sharing information, not security. So security has been an add-on that's had to be basically since the late 80s, it's had to be uh, an add-on. The thing about the Internet is it's a network. It's like a roadway or shipping lanes. It's not what uses the roadway or shipping lanes. And it, it essentially uses, it's not just new technology, it uses technologies that have been invented over 150 years. Now, there's lots of different things that use the Internet that use the, these networks. We all know them. Uh, we share files, we chat, we watch streaming media, we do uh, web and email and, and lots of those are some of the most common ones. And it's very difficult to control because since it does use so many technologies and connections, you can only control the, the technologies, but it's hard to control uh, the whole web and the content. There's just too many people, just too many uh, connections. So speaking of which, um, there's no one company or nation that controls the Internet. Some try. You can, uh, we'll talk more about that. In other words, down at the bottom, every participant needs an IP address. So if you control the addresses or control accesses, just like a telephone number, everybody needs a, a number, a unique one. And so if you control that, you can control some parts of the internet, but you, but you know, information finds a way. It's basically for people that are technically uh, know the technical details. It's a, it's a network of routers. So if you control the company, like an internet service provider, 
that has the routers or organizations, then you can control at least what they take in or, or um, yeah. Well, okay, China does two things. Uh, it can control the internet service providers, which have the routers, and it can also control content by taking out that content. But China is not the only one. There's a gazillion, there's, there's uh, at least, I could rattle off a half a dozen or more nations which do the same thing. Okay, so let's look at the technologies which are required to create the uh, internet. Anybody know what this is? Okay, this, this is, I like having a presentation where I have, I, I like having chat and I ask questions. <laughs> no, 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 it's not, it's not sorry, it's just that that's, uh, China perhaps is one of the ones which is most in the news. But if you look at, for example, Thailand, or you look at uh, lots of others, uh, they control uh, access. Um, Russia right now is controlling a lot of uh, access to news. Um, okay. Telegraph, yeah, okay. And, well, okay, now there's two things. Is, is that Morse code looking thingy? <laughs> okay, there's the telegraph. Now, there's two parts to this. And here again, I'm going to try to cram all this into an hour, <laughs> uh, which should take a week instead of an hour. But, um, yeah, uh, there, and, and Jan's got it, the on-off, on and that's it. And the reason why I, I sometimes, you know, I talk to the students about how a telegraph works, and I say, why are you telling us about this old piece of equipment? Well, because if you understand how the telegraph works, you've got about half of the Internet. Uh, so this is the other half. In other words, you've got the hardware part, but then you've got the coding. You've got, and, and in this case, it's called Morse code. And <laughs> my whole is in there. Yay, Mike. Uh, SOS. Okay. So, uh, exactly. And, and so, you, what coding is, is whether you call it ones or zeros or dots or dashes or some other, uh, or like in the picture to the bottom right, which is still used, flashes of light. In other words, a signal can be created from anything, uh, any background. And so, uh, really, I didn't know that. That's, that's kind of cool, the, the encoding of the music in Morse code. Um, so what, what a code is, is it represents things. Now, Morse code only was able to represent um, English letters, at, in fact, capital letters and numbers. But as we got kind of a richer coding, we're able to present a lot more. So you have the hardware software. And so the telegraph, if you understand, like I said, how this works, you're kind of halfway there. So the way it, a telegraph worked was basically a transmitter. You hold down the key. It sends an electric current like transistors do today. It controls the electric current. And it activated an electromagnet that produced a clicking sound. And so all of the intelligence was in the mind of the <laughs> transmitter and receiver. And so, like I said, it, uh, there's code, language symbols, and instructions. Morse code had instructions, too. If I went da-da, 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 uh, that means I'm going to start a message, four A's. Um, and the codes now today can also represent colors and sounds and, uh, and stuff like that. Okay, so today what you have that's not much different from a uh, telegraph, as far as I'm concerned, is the transistor. Uh, in Around the time I was born, a transistor was something you could put on the tip of your finger. Now, the transistor down to the, to the bottom left there, that's just a diagram of something that is only about uh, 10 to 20 nanometers, billions of nanometers atoms in size so that you can have billions of them in the um, you can have billions of them in your smartphone and, or on, on one of those uh, chips there so you know you got chips and connections and all that like the little uh, circuit board down there and the codes have gotten richer so that you can represent about 110 different languages hundreds of thousands of symbols the codes there is, is a Unicode of the Arabic language, and you have 
circuits that are uh, logic circuits then that can present uh, uh, a logic. Here again, I'm trying to squeeze all this in to an hour. So, um, well, and that's, uh, there you go. And, and I'm coming up on that, Dal. Hang on a second, because I'm actually coming up on that. And the same thing, transistors were vacuum tubes. Okay, what is this? Here again, I'm, if we didn't have these technologies, we wouldn't have the internet. A telephone. Absolutely. Okay. So you've got the, now that happens to be, <laughs> I know, it happens to be a, a Swiss telephone from early days. And essentially what happened there was, is the voice would be converted to electrical signals. And then there was an electromagnet, see, it, not much different from a telegraph, electromagnet at the end that then converted the electrical signal back to voice. And telephone poles, uh, yeah, uh, in circuit switching rather than packet switching. So you've got, um, okay, so you, now look on the right and you'll see telephone poles used to look like that. Before they had what's called multiplexing, where you could send more than one signal. You had used to have a, a wire for every customer, so it, it used to just uh, be uh, ridiculous uh, as far as the telephone poles back uh, early days. So yeah, uh, the telephone pole um, or telephone, like I said, basically was not much different from the telegraph, except that it converted it to uh, waves. Um, and you can see a, an example of density waves of, of sound that are coming out of the speaker, but inside a wire, it looked very similar to that with regards to the electrons that were, mo that were moving. The copper atoms don't move, but the electrons then uh, would be jostled and you'd get a, a wave uh, coming out. Okay. So you needed those technologies in order to have one of these things. Uh, but both, uh, you know, voice, kind of, in other words, this is a smartphone, so you need uh, kind of the same, the idea with the coding and the telephone, the whole bit. Yeah, party lines. <laughs> exactly. I, I, like I said, I, if, if, I, if you allowed me to speak all day, I could give you a lot of details on this and examples and pictures, but I only have them now. Okay. So, okay, what are we seeing here? Yeah, pagers. Yep, yep, yep. Radio. So in order to have the little smartphones we have today, the smartphones, Marconi, up, upper left. Um, so the uh, our smartphones today are have radio receivers and transmitters. And in the old days, in fact, uh, let's see, if I put the picture back there, you see the little antennas? Those are the antenna, the radio antennas. Okay. So and, and as we had transistors, the radios became smaller and smaller. Instead of a, something that like a desktop that sat on a, a, a device, you could have a portable radio, and then you had transistor radios, and then you had radios inside your little smartphone. Uh, radio uh, waves, of course, have been used for uh, radio astronomy, and that uh, tower there, you can see many, many, many different ways that uh, radio uh, is used, and that's uh, a whole new presentation in itself. Okay, so the radio uh, basically converted uh, theater. The radio was the first time we were able to get one ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. <laughs> Laughing. Okay, <laughs> you're showing your age. Well, so okay, and I am too. Okay, so radio has converted electrical waves into electromagnetic waves, which simply needed space as a, a medium in, instead of wires. And of course, this opened up marvelous. In other words, it opened up communication with the moon and Mars and uh, across uh, and satellites and all of the above. So basically, there was a way that carried uh, the signal um, that was then converted to uh, electromagnetic waves at the other uh, destination. So all of these technologies, so, so what am I seeing here? All of these technologies so far have helped to contribute to the Internet being possible. Hello. Okay. So what are we seeing here? What kind of technology does this? Uh, and the ones on the, on the right are as a consequence of this technology. So what we're seeing is radio, radar. Yeah, there we go. 
Okay, so you've got radar. Um, it, well, exactly. <laughs> okay, so you've got radar. Well, the reason why vacuum tubes and, and then diodes, triodes, and transistors came about in the first place was radar took up a lot of power. And they were trying to find devices that you could change the, in other words, you could control the output uh, by not putting in so uh, terribly amount of input. Uh, didn't mention the technology. Well, now, Word Smith, you're exactly right. And uh, but that. So what I've done is I'm looking at elec electrical technologies. But you're right, beacon fires and such like that. Even on China, on the Great Wall of China, uh, they had fires that then, if you saw a fire, you could, in other words, fires go maybe 20 miles. And then the other person would light a fire. And so you could literally communicate over a very a semaphore, which was early 1800s. There was a couple actual college students in France, in Paris, who invented semaphore because they wanted to talk to each other at lunch. They were in two different universities. And so they invented that. Yeah, there's all kinds of cool. I taught telecommunications for years. And there's all kinds of cool things we could be talking about. But what I said, and plant networks, but what if, Terry uh, Eichlin says, what I've kind of restrained what I'm doing is to the electrical technologies which help to make the internet present. Um, but there's a huge amount that we could talk to a telecommunication. So anyway, the transistor, oh, yeah, I only have an hour. No, that's fine. I'd love the chat, and I will respond. I I'm, I'm just have limited time. Okay, so um, a transistor, you do not have to put a lot of input, electricity into it, in order to change the output, in other words, on or off, as Jan mentioned earlier. Okay, so so uh, the ra radar was invented in 1935, but kind of as, as an accident. In other words, I noticed earlier than that, that if you were trying to send radio and something got in the way, like a ship or an airplane, that it would block the signal. And so they're going, oh, and then you actually got a bounce back and you go, ooh. No, yeah, go ahead and inundate me. It's okay. I'll try to respond as much, excuse me, as much as possible. So radio detection and ranging was basically radio signals that bounce back. And so I mentioned, uh, and then transistors were invented in 1947. Okay, what is this? What am I depicting here? Here, here again, the theme of all of this is these are technologies which are required. Well, not only computers, but what kind of computer? In other words, after. After the first computers, we you had computers since the 40s, but these are since these are in the 70s. A capo, <laughs> yeah. In other words, the PC, which was actually a term that the IBM invented in 1981. But you're talking about personal computers, not something that cost a million dollars, like I started on. Uh, I went to high school in Silicon Valley, or what would become Silicon Valley, and you had these big mainframes with yeah. Apple II, one of my, that was the first one that I got, was an Apple II. I still have uh, an original one in the case and everything else. Um, so, and by the way, if anybody sees one that's on the bottom left there, Apple I, um, please let me know. Uh, the last one sold for somewhere near a million dollars. <laughs> there were only so many made. And I actually started on the Altair above. Speaking of, somebody mentioned Star Trek. It was named Altair because Altair is a star, and the person who designed it uh, saw that his daughter was watching Star Trek, and they, the place they were going that week was Altair. <laughs> so that's why that name comes about. But in any case, you're talking about personal computers, pe per computers that people can own. Uh, now, PC, if you look at the PC sales thing, you'll notice that personal computers the sale of them have been dropping because a lot of people are going to the smartphones. Mini computers, well, take uh, remember remember mini computers here in a minute because I'll be talking about that. Now, the reason that personal computers can come about was because of a technology called photomicrolithography, which is essentially saying you can take transistors and reduce them to the size of atoms. And so you're able to put more and more of these into a chip, which is Moore's law, and we can talk about it. It's not really a law, but uh, it basically said that uh, every two years or so, 
the processing power of computers doubles. Now, today, of course, smartphones are not just computers. They have a computer, a display, a keyboard, microphone, speaker, telephone, radio, GPS, camera, book. In other words, they're everything uh, in all in one. So there's a lot more technologies that go into, say, smartphones. But I'm just talking about the Internet today. <laughs> okay. Wasn't less. <laughs> okay. So. Let's talk about networks, because you have these technologies, but of course the technologies would be nice if you're just using them yourself, but how do I contact somebody in South Africa or Bhutan? Uh, and that means networks. Now, what are we looking at here? What's being depicted here? Telephone operators. Yep. Okay, the reason why you have telephone operators here is the same way as you had telegraph operators in the beginning. In other words, the early telephone networks required people. You pick up the phone and you go, and you somebody goes, um, and if it's Lily Tomlin, uh, it's, okay, you know, is this the party to who am I speaking? And then it's a horrible uh, Lily Tomlin. But you know what I mean. In other words, the idea is you have to have a, a human operator that intervened and then connected you physically to one or the other. And you see that huge Rolodex there that you can see then what telephone numbers uh, were handled by that particular uh, central station, that sort of thing. And then, of course, today we've got cell phones and all of the other types of networks. But it all began pretty much with uh, telephone networks. Yes. It, well, that, that, no, that's interesting, and I'm watching my time, but Syzygy, for example, when I was uh, the director of a branch campus, I used to sit in on uh, mayor's meetings and stuff or whatever, and so I got to see the telephone operating place here where I live, and it was a, a warehouse-looking thing, and they opened the door, and there was nothing there except for a, uh, a rack. <laughs> with a bunch of cards and stuff in the back of the of the room. And at one time, it had been completely full of, uh, of equipment. There's a, this wonderful uh, video that AT&T did back in the 50s to, or 60s to show how that worked in analog sage. OK, a separate, oh, absolutely. It was all, you know, the, the dial phone there, click, 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 was actually uh, tra that that was actually translated to physical little switches that were going. It's very fascinating. Okay, so telephone network, basically what it is. And why am I talking about telephone when you're talking about internet? Well, because telephone is still an integral part of the internet. And so you've got telephone companies that basically had central offices that subscribed connected users. You've got the hardware. Uh, the signals traveled over copper wires, which they do today unless they're traveling over a fiber optic or uh, cable or radio, wireless. And so every telephone user needed a unique number called a telephone number. The telephone number indicated what country, region, and then an assigned number for a device or person. It was usually a device at first, but then it became a person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, no more Nobel Prizes. Well, you got a point, uh, Sumo, because there was a lot. Bell Labs, a lot of Nobel Prizes came out of the work there. Well, and that's cool, and I'm glad to see Lemoore is, uh, if you have um, real connections like that, uh, please share them in, in chat. Okay, so now let's get to the internet. In other words, basically those are the types of technologies that um, we needed in order to have the internet. Okay, the internet began Back, uh, I, I was going to leave off the thing saying Sputnik and see if people knew. Well, modems, hang on to that I idea, the modem thing. Uh, but Sputnik, uh, basically when the Soviets launched Sputnik, is that jaws dropped in the U.S. Because essentially we knew that the Soviets were ahead in te technology. And if you could send a satellite up, you could send an intercontinental ballistic missile up. And so there was an agency created by the U.S. Department of Defense called the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, which uh, has been flipping back and forth between DARPA and ARPA. And if you notice all the different projects which they help work on, it's quite a huge number. Uh, but essentially, 
they were developing an idea to connect different types of computers because basically there were a lot of companies producing computers, particularly after transistors. I actually, in my high school, like I said, it was uh, in Silicon Valley, so our high school actually had one of those mainframes, and I started programming with the punch cards up there. Uh, but the first, the first networks, computer networks, were essentially between these mainframes and what was called a dumb terminal. That is, you could see, instead of doing punch cards, you could see stuff, you could type in, that was a vast improvement, but no, no computer could talk to another computer uh, yet. And so what DARPA was doing was trying to create something where they could. Yep, sneaker net. Uh, okay. In other words, you take stuff and you <laughs> walk it over to something. Um, oh, well, typing is only done if the person behind it is, uh, <laughs> is awesome. So, in any case, uh, at Telstar, I remember Telstar. Telstar was cool. And there was even a song uh, about Telstar. Let's see if I can do it. Let's see. Anybody old enough to remember that song? Telstar. Okay. So early computers were room size and they couldn't communicate with each other. So DARPA invented the ARPANET um, so that different computers could connect like that. And the first ARPANET only had four um, only had four connections. <laughs> and then the one to the right there, now, let me show you what that actually looks like, is a larger one. So what you have basically is the ARPANET uh, in the 60s, 70s, and uh, the ARPANET basically quit after 20 years in 1989, and it connected military sites and universities, which may seem strange today, but essentially in the, uh, from 69 to uh, 89, uh, well, to 83, uh, that was the case. And so you, you had, instead of internet service providers, you had these little things called inter interface message processors, a piece of equipment. And the, so by 10 years later, essentially 1977, that was the entire internet over there on the right. In other words, that was all the computers that were on the internet. Now, you'll notice that there are computers that are, overseas like London and such, but most countries are not yet connected to uh, the internet. And you'll see, you'll notice stuff like both Stanford and Eglin Air Force Base. Uh, you'll notice things like uh, um, well, Harvard and uh, the Pentagon. You know, it was it was a lot of and yeah, Rutgers, lots of stuff. In other words, they were both mostly military and stuff like that. Oh, thank you. Yes, if you now, I don't have time to click on the YouTube, but if you, if you other guys want to try that YouTube one, oh yeah, um, I that was a the IBM uh, uh, 360 was the one I first started programming on, and then the PDP 11 was what we had in our chemistry department. Okay, okay. so network media here again. I'm watching my time. Is there aren't that many? There aren't that many. Um, had a univac serious. Okay, so there aren't that many ways that we send messages from on a network. And you can either use space. In other words, you could have an interplanetary network, which actually there is. That's how we communicate with uh, rovers on Mars and that sort of thing. But most network has copper wires. Uh, which started back in the 1800s. They just improved. And there's different categories of ones. They even have CAT-89, Deep Space Network, absolutely. And so, oh, I have an Apple II, <laughs> but Apple III's are rare uh, because they didn't make very many of those. And so there's CAT-8 all the way, and then there's fiber optic cables and coaxial cables and all that good stuff. Okay, now what is this? Because most people don't even know this exists. Hey, question, why are the critical infrastructure connected to the internet when this is dangerous? Well, because Astra is that um, when these when the critical infrastructures and people were connected to the internet, most people didn't think of sabotaging them. In other words, it was to be able to see them and stuff like that. Now, what I will say is that 
when two th- uh, uh, 9-11 happened in 2001 is that I remember on the internet, you used to be able to go there and see uh, a lot of critical infrastructure, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. In other words, you, you couldn't see a, what a dam looked like or the insides of it or uh, electrical grids or something. It all disappeared because of the nature of, of having it be seen by everybody. And so um, the other thing I'll say is the Internet is a public network, but there's more networks. Networks and vastly more networks in the world that are not connected to the internet, and of course, you know uh, that sort of thing. Particularly uh, anything which needs security, businesses, military, and so. So yeah, this is undersea cables, and and they connect to places which are difficult to get to. In other words, it'd be really hard to put telephone poles across the Amazon basin, that kind of stuff. Uh, is the conduct yourself a uh, joke? <laughs> Conducted cable? <laughs> okay, um, yes. <laughs> okay, so what is this? Anybody old enough <laughs> to remember any of this stuff? <laughs> oh, okay. Modems, yes. Uh, I, I told you to remember modems. If you're, if you're old enough, you'll, you'll remember what an acoustic modem was. So... So, okay, so now, so, ooh, yes, 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 or 96 baud, even before that, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so now we're working into the 80s, okay, or, or end of the late 70s. So you, know, you have the U.S. Department of Defense uh, with the ARPANET, uh, but, you, but the telephone net exists. And so people, yep, modulator, demodulator, um, don't, don't tell anybody, but, <laughs> you know, uh, in the early days of telephones, you could, act, particularly when they're analog, uh, you could actually click and not have to pay the quarter because uh, you could actually click out a number because they're analog. And, and I did it a couple of times, you know, college students. Okay, so in any case, um, you could, um, oh yeah, okay. So in any case, there were college universities that said, well, we can do this. And so with the acoustic modem and, and, and some stuff like that, they made their own networks. One was called the Computer Science Network. One was called the BitNet, or because it's time, or because it's their network. And then this person, this, uh, this guy named Vincent Cerf, right there in the middle on the bottom, um, he was one of the early inventors of the uh, ARPANET. And a nice gentleman, because he basically he, he helped get a $5 million grant uh, to um, help connect the... the uh, uh, university networks and then the National Science Foundation had the supercomputers which they connected and so you had rival networks so to, so to speak other than just the Department of Defense ARPANET. Okay, so uh, and I just basically said this and so yeah now internet speed <laughs> the back, backbone then in other words uh, in 1985 the Fastest speed on a network was a blazing 1.5 uh, megabit per second, <laughs> which, of course, you're not talking baud anymore. You're talking, and then it got up to 45 megabits per second and stuff like that. But in other words, before before there was competition, and somebody mentioned that is that um, something blah, blah, blah. okay um, is that before there was competition, you basically had very slow speeds. Uh, uh, well, actually, yeah, 512. I remember when the 512 chip came out, and everybody goes, whoa, what do they think of next? Okay, so uh, this is a representation of the Internet in 2005. And so what I'm talking about here is once you took it out of the hands of the government or others and opened it up to commercial use, you had a huge amount of innovation the web grew at, at some points in the early 90s by a thousand percent per month, and the National Science Foundation basically turned over the net to commerce in 1995. And so now you've got the people that you pay today uh, to get on the internet. Is essentially. Ooh, well, a web uh, cast. Hang on to that. 
because the the web there, yes, the uh, uh, Tim Berners Lee or now Sir Tim Berners Lee uh, wanted uh, at CERN the particle accelerator wanted to share information among physicists uh, about what was going on in in a lot quicker time than in journals. Um, yeah, there you go on the on the, on the uh, 1995 talent. Okay, tell well tell that there's another one. Here again, there's a lot of protocols and stuff which I just can't get into because I don't have time. Now we're talking about applications. And if you wouldn't mind, I'm running short of time, but Kyoko was talking about uh, moves. <laughs> and if you want to chat about a move real quick or about uh, stuff, go ahead and chat about moves and other ways to uh, get moves, yes, uh, to talk about there because I'm watching my time here. Uh, I'm getting to the applications. <laughs> okay, M O O, um, moves. Yes, moves. Okay, so yes, lots of those <laughs> fun stuff. So let me talk. Instead of talking about individual applications, which you know you could do several presentations on, this is a presentation on the internet. But I can't. It's like just talking about the roadways. Well, it's not very exciting if you just have a roadway with nobody on it. Multi, yeah, object oriented, etc. Moves, um, and so uh, there were ways that people had bulletin boards and ways that uh, people used uh, networks even before the web. The web wasn't invented like until well, actually, it, they first fight it, yeah, fight on that, and then you had weird things like Archie and Veronica and and. Um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember some of the others, some fun different ways to connect before the World Wide Web. And so this is just within the time I, I've been teaching, or I taught university for about 25 years, and back when I started in 98, there were only 3% of the population of the world that were able to access the Internet. Now, bear in mind when I say access the Internet, that even today most people that can't afford their own, whoops, okay, let me uh, sit closer. Thank you, says Aji. Most people cannot afford to buy their own computer or smartphone is they have to use an internet cafe uh, or some, or their, or their university or their business uh, computer or whatever. Um, okay. I'm sitting a little closer. I don't want to redline it, but I'm sitting a little closer for voice here. Okay, so I overlaid the world population there to show you basically that the number of people that are on the Internet have been steadily climbing with regards to the population. And so uh, as of now, there's two-thirds almost of the people on Earth that can get to the Internet. Now, that still means one-third of the people on Earth, in other words, billions, cannot get to the Internet. So they're missing out. Well, how do we use the Internet? Yeah, Apple in person, exactly, okay. Um, so how do we use the Internet? Well, here is it. I'm not going to go over every one. You guys can read. But you'll, you'll see that we use the, well, <laughs> in the 90s, about a third of the, uh, I didn't put porn. <laughs> But in the 90s, it was about a third of the people, but, um, or the content anyway. But these are the top uses of the Internet as of 2022 uh, by the company down there at the bottom left. And so basically, we still use it for finding information. In other words, what, what applications do we use? Search engines, although more young people, more young people use uh, social media for searching rather than a search engine, which I find interesting. We stay in touch with people, social media, chat, VOIP for voices and such, streaming media, uh, the web still is big, social media is still big uh, for all of those things. But you can see what people use the internet for. And a couple of these slides are a little dense, and I'm not going to go over everything. I'm just going to hit the highlights of them. Um, I'm planning in the not too distant future to is very new. <laughs> I'm planning in the not too distant future that to make uh, presentations that I've uh, done 
uh, publicly available. I'll probably stick them over so I don't bother um, uh, Science Circle. I'll stick them over on STEM <laughs> Island. But uh, basically, notice, like I said, that about a third of the people, two thirds can use the internet, although if that means a third can't. Most of the people that are uh, use the internet are in cities uh, because of the connections. A lot of people use mobile phones. There's a lot of people on social media. And you can see what sorts of social media down at the bottom, anyway, that people um, orient for. <laughs> um, and let's see, did I just, uh, come on. There, OK. So but remember that, that the internet is not just something for our individual entertainment, in other words, the, um, and I think I went past the slide, hang on a second, let me go back. Okay, so the average user, now I find this amazing, but if you actually think about it, if you're listening to a radio, if you've got the computer kind of on, if you've, uh, yeah, there you go, uh, you can advertise there, <laughs> is, or if you list, if you're talking to people, if you're research, doing whatever, uh, yeah, 20 minute job. But think of it, I mean, you spend a lot of your waking life on the internet and although it has uh dropped okay and then the smartphone use is amazing too is well meaning that you use less or more <laughs> but uh smartphone use then varies from indonesia to uh other uh, nations those are just the top users but that means a 10 trillion hours per day spent using the <laughs> Thing. Well, uh, okay, so be, well, otherwise you'd be 25 hours a day. Okay, so, but remember, it's not a, the internet is not for individual use all the time. There's been a lot of, and these are, is, there's only a, a, a small amount of examples, but you, but if you can actually connect a lot of computers at, at one time and, uh, and then collaborate on projects, like Wikipedia, Second Life, yeah, I put that in there, and fold it, and the SETI at home and stuff, you can get a lot accomplished. Yeah, uh, and basically one of the interesting things about that it was using non-productive processing time. In other words, when a computer was on, but it wasn't doing anything. So, so it was basically in the background, which is cool. Okay, so, okay, so uh, now who controls the Internet? For the sound down on the own because of music human rich. Yeah. Um, okay, so and and please continue with the uh, uh, chat. I love to see it as well. Yeah, fold it was and is cool. Um, although there is a there is a now a AI that can do better than uh, fold it uh, users can uh, by by many, many times, which is interesting. Okay, now who controls the internet? Anybody before I, I got 10 minutes, so I'm on time. Who controls the internet? Al Gore. <laughs> China. Okay. Well, okay, now, okay, now, since you mentioned Al Gore, what's, what's uh, the government? Okay, sir. Uh, what did Al Gore contribute? Al, okay. Illuminati. Uh, DNS. Harris. Okay, so Al Gore. What he actually contributed, and, and and for people outside the United States, you might not. Well, no, he didn't fund the uh, research, but what he did do is he was a senator, and he basically uh, was a techie person. Um, and he said, look, there's this thing called, uh, you know, NSFNet and the Internet and stuff. And so why can't everybody use it? Why is it just for research and other stuff? And so he introduced a bill called the High Performance um uh, Computer Computing Act in 1991 that was passed, and that kind of is the beginning of the future because basically then the internet took off. That's what his contribution is. So let's take a look. First of all, there were different initiatives. As I mentioned, there was the ARPANET, which was, um, and then bills providing funding. Okay, so the ARPANET was a U.S. Department of Defense project, and then there were university initiatives. And then there was a National Science Foundation uh, initiative there for about 20 years. 
And then it was turned over to commercial, in other words, to the people you pay today. And so the network infrastructure is controlled by commercial enterprises, by people who you pay to get on the internet. And if you're not, and, if you, and then the people who you pay are sometimes paying other people. And so, but the technology has changed from individual control. Well, and Abba, you got the, you got what kind of in one sentence, what, in other words, nobody can control it. It's too big. There's too many connections, too many types of technologies uh, for uh, over a hundred and more years. Uh, it's, it's impossible for any one group to control it. So, but I am, so these are the initiatives. Um, it's, it, it's a multi-headed beast that the heads keep coming back if you try to chop them off. Um, okay, like Cyclops, or not Cyclops, what was it, the, the uh, beast with the multiple heads? Okay, so internet and web technology basically changed from Hydra, from one uh, person controlling the whole thing. Hang on a second. If somebody knows the name of it, you get an extra point uh, of the person who actually controlled IP addresses. Um, well, and I, yeah, and I didn't put that in there, Melody. There's lots of different other things here. It is basically from individual control to that of governments, use, Usenet or UUNet, uh, and there was also a more, to now uh, UN and multi-state uh, companies have a stake in this thing. Well, an intranet, yes, have intra, and, and universities essentially have intranets. Uh, militaries, commercial, all have intranets. In other words, there's a lot that's not on the internet that's also contained and such like that. So, okay, so here's some initiatives. Let's take a look at the technology itself. And here again, these are very dense slides, and I'm talking faster than I normally would. So uh, apologies to uh, people, but this is an overview of the internet over 50 years and how far we've come. So in the late 1970s, when there were only 20 networks on the internet, you had a couple groups which then were able to look at the technology and control what was going on. In the 80s, when you had personal computers and you had universities and other people that were associated, well, and that's true, is that essentially like Pandora's box, it's uncontrollable, which is good for you and me because, uh, well, and there's several things that Finnish uh, have created. That's a, that's a good thing. Well, now that's a very good question, Baragon, and I'm not sure, but it is possible by cutting cables or by other things that you can cut people off or uh, control uh, media and content. Okay, so in the, in the 80s, when there were more networks, uh, you had other groups, particularly like Internet engineering task force, which uh, created the, the uh, technology, the great or so-called great firewall. And then when you started having many more networks, in other words, with the web and such, then you have what's called the Internet Society, which that same guy that you saw the picture of, that in surf, he was the uh, first uh, head of that. And then while the web is not a part of the Internet, it's obviously one of the main vehicles, like cars, so to speak, that uh, are on the internet. And so you have the World Wide Web Consortium in 1994. Look at how fast it grew. There's now hundreds of thousands of networks headed by Tim Berners-Lee. Okay, so this is kind of the tech, uh, who controls the technology, not the content, who controls the technology. Let's then look at access. Is that just like a telephone, you have have to have a unique number. Well, how do you control that everybody, five billion people in the world have a unique number? And the way you do it is the same way telephone companies used to do it. In other words, you have a single agency with helpers controlling it. And so there are public IP addresses. Those are controlled by agencies, these ones that I'm showing you right here. And then there's private IP addresses which, in other words, for example, inside a university or inside a business, they can use any of the private you know, uh, addresses you want, so long as that they don't get out to the Internet itself. In 1988, there was a, um, yeah, oh, Telstar song, thank you. I was like that, it was on a synthesizer of some sort. Okay, so 1988, 
this group, this assigned member's authority, they control or they control the IP addresses, that is, numbers which are like a telephone number. They control the domain name system, which is like .com, .edu, .net, .info, .whatever, museum. And then there are media types, like PDF, uh, JPEG, uh, all of that. Um, and then in 1998, now one person, now this is kind of cool, is that one person controlled the IP addresses from 1969 to 1997, and unfortunately he passed away in 1998. And before he passed away, uh, that was a guy named John Postle. He was a computer science professor. <laughs> and before he passed away, there was a uh, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which was originally a nonprofit corporation in the United States before 2016. That wasn't very long ago. And then it became a global entity afterwards. Now, to that, like I said, 2016 has not, is not very long ago. And does anyone know who, that was the name I was looking at, is John Postal or Postel? Now, does anyone, well, now hang on a second, yeah, I can. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, let me go ahead, because I've got about four minutes, is the ICANN people, because there's five billion <laughs> uh, users, and there's many, many, many more devices that use IP addresses, that, you know, sensors in your car, and uh, in in homes and uh, printers and stuff all have IP addresses, although not all public IP addresses. Aliens control it. Yep. Okay. So um, ICANN has some agencies. Actually, this is not ICANN. But yeah, it is. It's uh, that help control the IP addresses in different parts of the world. And so it used to be all just one agency, and then they started splitting off in different years. And you can see in that. 1992, that there was an agency that controlled the ones uh, to everything from Greenland to over to uh, Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Russia. And then you've got ones, Africa was the latest one. And so these are different agencies that help control the IP addresses as a powerful union. Yep. <laughs> okay, I'm on time, by the way, folks. I've only got, let's see, how many information? Um, this is the last slide. Da -da -da. Okay, so internet policy, though, it used to be just a few people long ago. But the UN, once, once uh, the web became a powerful thing, which was essentially in the 2000s, you had the UN going in there and going, okay, we need to be talking about this on a global, le on a global scale, not just an American non you know, nonprofit corporation or other groups that are controlling things and so they had a world summit which unfortunately didn't agree on anything and then in um 2005 they said why don't we create a governance forum that's in the U in un so that we can discuss everything from national and private and public and academic and technical use of the internet and so the un in 2006 founded the Internet Government Governance Forum for five years, and then renewed it in 2011, and then it renewed it for 10 years in 2016, so it goes to 2025. And, ah, excuse me. Okay, so in 2010, they also created another group, which is called the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, which had a working group, you know, because it um, with working groups to improve the idea. So, you know, there's a lot of committees and blah, 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 but essentially what I have, and I've got technically one minute. So in summary, the internet is, as people have mentioned, is too big for one group to control. There are international groups that control the technology, commercial groups which control the infrastructure, in other words, how the, the hardware and stuff. The technology is more or less, if you want to call it the software and such. Um, 
The United Nations has gotten involved because it's global. There's about 5 billion people on the internet, but still a third of the world that can't get to it and so do not have access to the types of things that people, well, that all of you do because you're listening to me and each other. And so um, <clears throat> the one thing I didn't mention, and uh, I'm now at my hour, is the idea of, in other words, the internet so far is, is, is pretty open. And I'm trying to remember the term for it, but essentially net neutrality. So in other words, if you want to send your cookie recipe to a friend, essentially it has the same importance as a nation's president sending a email to his group or some other thing like that. In other words, it's, it's kind of, in theory, the most democratic thing ever is the internet. But there are ways that that might change, and so uh, that's the idea of net neutrality. And so far, we've we've been able to keep that, uh, but hopefully, it will not come to like okay, if you want your uh, cookie recipe to go to your friend, it's going to cost you an extra amount, or else it won't get there for the next week. You know that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, so open it up to questions, comments, which we've been having a lot of. Thank you. Oh, thank you.